On this Sunday night, eyewitness allegations against powerful forces on both sides of the Atlantic. In a Canadian exclusive, a whistleblower cries foul about Brexit's leave campaign and points to a Canadian company. You have meddled with, uh, with our democracy. While in the United States, the woman known as Stormy Daniels finally speaks out about her relationship with Donald Trump. He knows I'm telling the truth. But will the allegations change anyone's mind? This is The National. You have been hearing a lot about Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and how companies can use information to target you to influence your vote. Now from whistleblowers, we're learning more about the role a Canadian company played in one of the most consequential vote results in recent history the UK's decision to exit the EU. Independence Day! The dawn is breaking on an independent United Kingdom. Fact, it was close. 51.9% voted to leave. Question, did all sides play by the rules? Possibly not, is the concern embedded in hundreds of documents landing at the UK Electoral Commission just a few days ago providing some of the most compelling evidence yet that the Vote Leave campaign may have overspent its campaign limits, giving it an extra last-minute edge. A big deal? Well, here's how the lawyer putting together the dossier described it to CBC News. Because the referendum was a close-fought contest, it's massively constitutionally significant, if there was overspending, then what has been trumpeted as the will of the people might have been, in fact, something that was paid for. That really matters. The UK's Guardian, The New York Times and The National have obtained access to some of the key documents, two of the whistleblowers and details of the Canadian connection. It's a story that's prompted reaction from 10 Downing Street itself. We've got our country back. Hey! How the Brexit vote came to in any way be associated with the small BC company started with an early morning email from now famous Canadian whistleblower Chris Wiley to another Canadian, an old colleague, Jeff Sylvester, back in August of 2013. It was about Wiley's job in London with what would be the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. CBC has seen a duplicate of the exchange. We mostly do psychological warfare work for NATO, Wiley offered, explaining its political and social campaigns, too. You need a Canadian office, came the response from Sylvester. Basically, that's how the idea of aggregate IQ was born. By 2016, it was its own completely independent Canadian entity. On June 24th, vote, leave. And a powerhouse on the official vote, leave campaign. 40% of the leave campaign spending went to this small tiny company uh, on Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. Um, and its, its role in, in Brexit is fairly central because it managed all of the uh, digital and social targeting uh, for the pro-Brexit campaign, for, for vote leave. That effectively means pinpointing and reaching out to likely supporters. But it's like, Wiley was still in the picture, was introducing another friend, Shamir Sani, to work as a Vote Leave volunteer, as he told CBC News in a Canadian exclusive. I joined the Vote Leave campaign as a volunteer several months before the referendum. There he is, beaming in his Vote Leave shirt. He was soon asked to work on a youth outreach arm called Believe. The small believe unit, Sani says, talking to, taking instruction from the established vote leave team and more. We were based in the vote leave office and we were in constant communication with other vote leave staff members because as volunteers we never saw ourselves as having uh, full control over the outreach group because we didn't have the experience. That's important. His words and the new supporting documentation offer what Sani's lawyer says is the first substantial evidence these groups worked closely together. Why does that matter? So there's no rule against coordinating campaigns. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when two coordinated campaigns are used to exceed spending limits. This is about spending. 
It's not clear that's what happened, but money, it seems, was an issue for Vote Leave. CBC has seen a witness testimony that suggests towards the end of the campaign, it was office chatter that Vote Leave was nearing its £7 million spending cap. To spend more would be breaking electoral law. But Little Believe seemed to be just getting started. Sani, now in a leadership role, no longer just a youth branch, it was its own campaign organization with a smaller spending limit of its own. One day, Vote Leave officials brought good news. Believe was getting donations of roughly £625,000. This was very close to referendum day. So by this time, so we had decided to give the, so we had been told to, that we have to give the money to AIQ and, and AIQ being a Canadian company, I guess, you know, uh, so uh, who were actually based in the Vote Leave office. They were there till the last day. They were there on referendum day. AIQ, that's aggregate IQ. So this Canadian-based company already working with Vote Leave that had, according to Sani, workers in the Vote Leave offices was now going to be paid to work with Believe. So what did Believe get for that money? Sani maintains it was just a few thousand phone numbers and emails. If he's right, he says that seems like a lot of money for not much return. Did AIQ really spend it all on Believe or did it go elsewhere? There's a, a hole in this story, which is it precisely what... AIQ did with all the money they were given by campaigners in the EU referendum. What happened to that money? Who were they working for and what messages did they put out? To whom? Using what, what, what data? AIQ told CBC News in a statement the money it received was only used for Believe's campaign and purposes and no other purpose. Vote Leave and Believe have both issued statements saying they were completely separate entities and spending caps were not violated. But this doesn't seem to sit well with Sani. Why are we being constantly told by senior staff members of Vote Leave that we um, didn't coordinate when we so obviously did? One reason I'm doing this is because the people of this country were lied to. You can't undo Brexit. Once Brexit happens, it's done. Um, and for me, what's so concerning is that the scale of cheating that happened potentially on the referendum, irrespective of whether you supported Remain or Leave, this is an irreversible change to the constitution of a country. So these are hard things to say. And so in all of this, what of aggregate IQ? What did it know or do? In an email response to CBC, AIQ wrote... AIQ works in full compliance within all legal and regulatory requirements in all jurisdictions where it operates. It has never knowingly been involved in any illegal activity. Adding, it was not aware of any evidence of coordination between vote leave and be leave to break any rules. Wendy Mesley has been working on the story for her Sunday morning program, The Weekly. Wendy, we just saw that there are questions about aggregate IQ in the United Kingdom, but... There are questions here as well. It's really interesting. We know that the UK Information Commissioner is investigating Cambridge Analytica. Late last week, it got a warrant to go in and search the Cambridge Analytica offices in London. And part of that investigation includes the company's links to Aggregate IQ. So, of course, that company, AIQ, is based in BC. So trying to figure out what's going on here, I, I spoke to the province's privacy commissioner, and he says, yes, they are cooperating with the UK's investigation into the possible unauthorized use of people's data for political purposes, and whether AIQ may have been involved here. So I, of course, wanted to know exactly what are you looking at, and he says, well, there's an ongoing investigation. I can't hear and, and in uh, the UK, so he can't give us any details. So I said, well, what, what then is the general concern? Well, the concern is that information cannot be disclosed or even collected or disclosed unless we have informed consent of the individual. So if people didn't know that their people, their information was being used, then that's offside with our privacy legis legislation here in BC. And we want to know the facts around did they collect information, did they use it, and did they disclose it to anyone else for purposes that people might not be aware of. So we know that AIQ knows about 
all these inquiries. What's it actually saying about them, though? Well, the company's not giving interviews anymore, um, but it did send me a statement where it said about MacArthur uh, and the Privacy Office, saying Aggregate IQ is and always has been cooperating fully with the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner for BC. AIQ also stressed to us that it has never been a part of Cambridge Analytica or its parent company, SCL. But that's odd because the co-founder of AIQ told me a couple of weeks ago in a phone conversation that, yes, it had sold its data technology to SEL, the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. So there are some links here. What are, are they exactly? Well, we'll have to wait for the investigators to, uh, to report. Okay, a lot more to come. Wendy Mesley, thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Adrian. And those investigations are top of mind tonight in Britain's halls of power. Theresa May facing critical new questions about the Brexit vote. That's because people who now advise the British Prime Minister are directly linked to these new allegations. Thomas Dagla picks up the story in London. As Brexit draws closer, people here look back at the referendum with more and more questions. And second thoughts are turning bitter. I can see that there could be some underhand business going on and we've all got sucked into it. Well, if it's true, it's uh, really unforgivable. But uh, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what the facts were. That's where Kyle Taylor comes in, a Canadian-American activist for electoral transparency based here in the UK. Um, here on the evidence page, we've got the what the Electoral Commission says um, is sort of of coordination and his fair vote campaign is sharing the whistleblowers emails and documents for the whole country to see files that purportedly show coordination between brexit campaigns that may have allowed vote leave to cheat i hope that people are outraged and worried um, because the what's what happened here can happen again, and it, it's and from what we've seen, has happened all around the world. Boris Johnson, a leading voice for Brexit, now Britain's foreign secretary, called the allegations utterly ludicrous. Vote Leave won fair and square and legally. He tweeted. The individuals concerned have denied it. Uh, it's really a matter. Uh, if, there's any, if there's any truth to it at all, for the Electoral Commission to investigate. Making matters even more awkward, at 10 Downing Street, two of the Vote Leave officials under media scrutiny now work here as advisors to the Prime Minister. One of them, Stephen Parkinson, responded to the allegations by denying wrongdoing and revealing his past relationship with the whistleblower, Shamir Sani. Outing him as gay to his family in the world, family he has in Pakistan, who are now fearing for their safety. I mean, what have we come to? This MP says an investigation by the elections watchdog isn't enough. The police need to come in. I mean, this is criminal law. This is criminal law breaking, if it's true. There's no plan for Britons to get a second say on leaving the EU. The country continues its slow drift toward Brexit. The truth around the vote is as murky as ever. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, London. So, Adrian, what's next in all of this? Well, tomorrow, Ian, the two whistleblowers are going to hold a news conference in the UK, and a portion of those documents will be landing on the desks of some investigators and some parliamentarians. So, more than likely, this is going to stretch out a bit. And our coverage on it will continue. But let's turn now to a much different kind of political controversy, this one in the United States. Millions of people watching the CBS News program 60 Minutes tonight wondering, did Stormy Daniels live up to her stage name? She has been the eye of a hurricane around President Trump for weeks. Until now, Daniels has remained silent about that alleged sexual encounter with Trump, the billionaire businessman, more than a decade ago and the payment she received from Trump's lawyer that some are describing as hush money. So, what did she say? Ellen Morrow has the details. Donald Trump had no response for reporters as he arrived at the White House after a weekend at his Florida retreat. But he had to know this was coming because it was very important to me to be able to defend myself. Stormy Daniels' first television interview on her alleged sexual encounter with Trump. You told Donald Trump to turn around and take off his pants? Yes. And did he? Yes. So he turned around and pulled his pants down a little. You know, he had underwear on and stuff, and, and I just gave him a couple swats. Daniels, a porn actress, says she had sex with Trump just once in 2006. She claims she was later told to keep quiet or else. A guy walked up on me and said to me, 
leave Trump alone, forget the story. And then he leaned around and looked at my daughter and said, a, a beautiful little girl, it'd be a shame if something happened to her mom. And then he was gone. Daniels also discussed a $130,000 payment she received from Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, a so-called hush agreement signed just days before the 2016 election. Cohen now says he paid out of his own pocket and was not reimbursed by the Trump campaign, but it could still be a big problem for the president. It's a $130,000 in-kind contribution by Cohen to the Trump campaign, which is about 126,500 above what he's allowed to give. And if he does this on behalf of his client, the candidate, that is a coordinated, illegal, in-kind contribution by Cohen for the purpose of influencing the election. I think I ended the relationship. Daniel's interview comes just days after this. Somebody's lying, and I can tell you it's not me. Former Playboy playmate Karen McDougal detailing her alleged affair with Trump. The White House has denied that Trump had sex with McDougal or Stormy Daniels, but Trump himself has been uncharacteristically quiet. The president watches 60 Minutes. If he's watching tonight, what would you say to him? He knows I'm telling the truth. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. So far, though, President Trump has been the Houdini of political scandal, always escaping. Yet Stormy Daniels is just one of a trio of female litigants who could complicate his presidency. You saw a glimpse of a second one near the end of Ellen's story, and she had more to say. After we had been intimate, he, he tried to pay me, and I actually didn't know how to take that. Karen McDougal was a Playboy model in 2006 when she says she met the married Donald Trump and began a 10-month affair. Were you in love with him? I was, yeah. Then, during the presidential campaign, the company that owns the National Enquirer paid McDougal $150,000 for her story, but it was never published. McDougal now says she was misled and has sued to invalidate the contract. I'm not out to make money on this. I'm out to get my rights back, to prove a contract was illegal, that I was taken advantage of, and then go back to my life. In a third case, Summer Zervos, a former contestant on The Apprentice, is suing the president for defamation after he blasted her allegations that she was sexually harassed. He put me in an embrace, in an embrace and I tried to push him away. This week, a New York judge ruled her suit could proceed, so three cases which raise the specter of Donald Trump having to answer questions under oath which could lead to the risk of serious political damage. Ahead tonight on The National, Nala Ayed will take us on an unusual sightseeing tour in London. You won't find Big Ben or Buckingham Palace on it. Instead, multi-million dollar properties used to launder dirty Russian money. And a little later, she's 22 years old, still lives with her parents, and tonight she's in the same Juno category as Shania Twain and Gord Downey. I'll sit down with Ruth B. But first, as hundreds of thousands mobilize in the wake of the Parkland school shooting, Paul Hunter talks to students in Baltimore who are all too familiar with gun violence and who are asking, what about us? How many people here know somebody who's being shot? Raise your hand. Did the part when somebody got shot here, did Parkland come say something to us? No. Did we have a march? No. Baltimore doesn't get a voice all that big because, of it, because the city is predominantly black. My relatives, my last goodbyes. I didn't know where we were, we were going to land. Some frightening moments for passengers this evening on board a Air Canada flight from Toronto's Pearson to Washington's Reagan National. The plane had to make an emergency landing at the other Washington airport, Dulles, after pilots saw smoke in the cockpit. The landing was said to have been without incident. All 63 passengers and four crew members unharmed. At least 37 people are dead after fire tore through a shopping mall in the Russian city of Kemerovo, that is in Siberia, about 3,000 kilometers east of Moscow. Russian media say dozens more people, including children, still missing. An investigation is underway to try to figure out what caused this fire. It's a British attraction many tourists may have missed. The Dirty Money Tour, organized by an anti-corruption campaign it offers a glimpse into a world of mysterious wealth and a city where 35,000 properties have suspicious foreign owners. So when Arnala Ayed was invited to take the tour, 
She signed up for our dispatch tonight from London. You will find it absolutely fascinating and frightening in equal measure. In London, there's a tour for every taste. But this is one sightseeing bus with an eye-opening political agenda. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the kleptocracy tour of Russia. The kleptocracy tour follows the money. And I'm going to start off talking about uh, a couple of properties that we've just been looking at to your left. And in this edition, the wealthy Russian oligarchs close to Vladimir Putin, who allegedly hide their ill-gotten fortunes in some of London's priciest real estate. This isn't a tour of the London you and I know, the London of famous bridges, Buckingham Palace and Big Ben. The landmarks here are multi-million dollar mansions and apartments, like two flats at number four Whitehall Court, where the tour begins. We believe that they are owned by Igor Shuvalov, who is the Russian first deputy prime minister. A high-ranking politician in Russia whose annual income is supposedly about £112,000 a year. So it would take him 76 years to save up all his salary, not spending a single penny to afford that property. Now you have to ask, where did that extra money come from? It certainly raises suspicions. Long-standing suspicions. But it was just one day after the prime minister said it was highly likely Russia was behind the nerve agent attack in Salisbury when the tour organizers sent out invitations. Why do Putin allies flock to London? Because it's a global hub that's safe, a place where you can launder millions in a single transaction and all without revealing your identity like the $27 million allegedly paid by one oligarch to buy number 102 Eaton Square. So we're on our way to Eaton Square, which is often known as Red Square. Because Red Square because so many Russians own apartments here. This journalist and author also calls this city London Grad. Russian oligarchs love buying property in the most prestigious areas of London, which they regard as the sort of epicenters of the British establishment. If you push them outside of the Western world to which they are accustomed, I think um, the foundations for autocracy and corruption in Russia will be heavily undermined. So we have a mood of chill between London and Moscow. There are hints the government may be considering it. The Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Committee has planned hearings this week. Invited to testify are several of our tour guides. There's a growing recognition on all sides of British politics that this is corrosive. Uh, and actually, it's the one vulnerability that the Putin government has. In the drive to put an end to London grad, there's certainly growing momentum. Nalayed, CBC News, London. A school shooting in Parkland, Florida sparked a nationwide call for gun reform. Up next, Paul Hunter talks to students in Baltimore who say their calls for help continue to go unanswered. It's like they just don't care about black people. Yeah, I don't think they care about black people either. They, they might say they do, but your actions speak louder than your words. and our ambitions are unbeatable. Let's keep the guns out of the hands of the wrong people. Hundreds of thousands of young people taking a powerful stand yesterday. They cried out against gun violence and politicians who refused to act. One powerful message, a silent tribute to the dead. But also check out the crowd's reaction to what this fifth grader had to say. I am here today to acknowledge and represent the African-American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper. School shootings grab everyone's attention, but they don't represent the whole picture, the everyday toll of U.S. gun violence in some communities. Paul Hunter visited a school in Baltimore where students don't feel connected to the Parkland tragedy. They've got their own problems. <laughs> Just for a moment, forget about Parkland, Florida, the home, for now, of America's gun control debate. This is Baltimore, 
home to more gun killings last year per capita than any other big city in the country. On average, almost one per day. Balloon memorials mark where the dead fell, and there are lots of them. And so as Americans talk yet again of gun control, not least how to protect its young people, consider this school, XL Academy. I wanted you to read to yourself about um, disease control. Disease Where control. students who've struggled in other schools come seeking a second chance, a place that isn't in the headlines much and that didn't spark a march on Washington, even though it has its own sobering death count. How many kids in this school have been shot and killed in the last year or so? Eight total. Eight? Eight. Yep, we've lost eight students to gun violence. How do you feel about that? I'm overwhelmed, um, sometimes just tired. You don't imagine as a principal this is part of your job, but it is. To be clear, none of the eight students were killed on school property. It was all out on the streets. Let's go, ladies who are waiting for me in my conference room. Everybody else, let's go. But as they gather for class on a week, yet another student from this school had been shot and wounded. Fear mixes with resignation, frustration with resentment. How many people here know somebody who's been shot? Raise your hand. Three students who face not only that, but headlines these days that convince them no one's calling for tougher gun laws in their name. But a black person gets shot, do they do anything about it? No. Do, did the part when somebody got shot here, did Parkland come say something to us? No. Did we have a march? No. Baltimore doesn't get a voice all that big because, of it, because the city is predominantly black. So since the city is predominantly black, they don't they're not going to pay any attention to it. It's like they just don't care about black people. Yeah, I don't think they care about black people either. They, they might say they do, but your actions speak louder than your words. As we spoke, Michaela Gray's boyfriend was in hospital. It was he who'd been shot this week, just before school, two days earlier. It barely made the news. Now people is getting killed in daylight. Not just at night, like in daylight. It don't matter where you are. You don't have to be involved in anything, any gang violence, any drugs, and still get killed. Do you hear gunshots? Oh, yeah. Frequently. Frequently. Um, but th that's, that's a part of the culture that's been accepted. For Munir Bihar, that's the problem, the culture of right. violence it's, it's in Baltimore. He of. himself grew up in it, to in and out of jail in his teens. He turned his people. life around. Now he wants to change Baltimore and that's all of those who say normal. it can't be done. There's a funeral almost every damn day of a young black man in this city killed by the hands of an another young black man. That's not normal. I just refuse to accept that as normal. I refuse to just live my life and like, oh, it's all right, brothers die. It's a part of life. Oh, it happens. It's the hood. No, that's, that's not real, and I refuse to accept it. Who would like to challenge themselves? Raise your hand, please. Come on up, Wayne. Come on up, little man. His response, the gun problem up, is King. fixable up, from please. the bottom up. One, two. Munir started a program aimed at helping Four, kids steer clear five. of violence. Yeah, my man got some strong legs. In a One city where so, so many gun deaths and are within the black community. I want to see a young, successful man. He That's teaches discipline, focus, right respect, now. with the view turning kids into better people will achieve far more than merely husband, protesting father. for tougher gun laws. Health, education, literacy, mental health, recreation, if we're not doing this, but we're just demanding that things change without the ingredients of the change, I think that's just an absence of logic. People have died so that you have an opportunity to show your brilliance. You know when you're doing wrong, but you also know when you're doing right. The vast majority of young black men dying by guns in America are not being uh, killed. They're not dying by AR-15s. So ban AR-15s, cool. It changes nothing in terms of the problem of homicides in the black community. 
as it stands, the shootings here effectively never stop. So, up the steps and into the home of yet another family stung by gun violence, community workers Walker Gladden and Clayton Guyton. I want to start with uh, how your week was. Mm -hmm. Let me start. Don't matter. On this night, it's to meet with Keandre Greenwich. He was shot last year, one day after school. Says Keandre, guns are simply a fact of his world. He's 14 years old. That's ain't gonna never end. You talking about gun violence? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that's going to stay forever. Is it that bad? Like, that's, that's normal? Normal with me. Right now, the sense of urgency is so great. Uh, immediate response is so great that I don't have time to really wait. We got to move now. You know, we dying. We got to move. You know, our young people are dying. Our community is deteriorating. You know, I like to see his face from time to time. Walker's so, own really son is among them. Here, shot and, uh, dead in 2016. That's him on the pendant. All those anti-gun demonstrations, they say, it's mostly people from a different America pointing to the country's lingering racial divide on why the gun problems in mostly black Baltimore seem to get so little national attention. Our change is still not here yet because it's so difficult. But see, we're up for it. So no, we're not mad with them because, uh, and we're not really upset with them because we know, hey, it's easy for you. You can't stand up for the problems in our community without somebody looking at you and saying, you're an angry black man. We still going in the back door. That's where we're at. So what is the way forward in a city with so many gun deaths week after week? You can march all you want. You can march every day for hours asking for justice and for your voice to be heard. But if the people in the city not changing, then the violence isn't going to stop. I pray that something will change, but then, like I said, maybe it won't. A blunt assessment by those not yet ready to believe anyone outside the city's even listening. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Baltimore. Put the anxiety those students feel into some more context. Consider this. Last month, Baltimore went 11 full days without a homicide, just the third such homicide-free stretch in the city in more than 15 years. We have a lot more ahead tonight on The National, celebrating the best in Canadian music. Eli Glasner will give us the view from the Juno Awards. And she's nominated in several of the big categories tonight. I sit down with Ruth B. for the national interview. We talk about writing songs that matter and her remarkable breakout success. We play in the woods, always on the run from Captain Hook. Music was always in my life and I loved it, but it was always my secret. And Vine kind of helped me expose my love for music to the rest of the world. And yeah, if it weren't for that, I don't know if I would be here. You help me walk through thickets again and again. Sarah Harmer helping to pay tribute tonight to Gord Downey at the Junos. It's been five months since the tragically hip frontman passed away. Downey won three awards this weekend, including Artist of the Year. And our Eli Glasner was at the award show in Vancouver about a block that way. Uh, here he is with some of this evening's other highlights. Balloons are being popped. The crowd are still on the feet as the bare naked ladies close out the 2018 Juno Awards in fitting style with a rousing edition of If I Had a Million Dollars. And they have a million fans and more as we saw Stephen Page rejoining with the bare naked ladies doing two numbers to close out the show. And that was just one of many stunning numbers at this year's Junos. The Junos opened by Michael Bublé. Very comfortable on stage comedic but also really heartfelt talking about uh, what he's experienced the, his son battling cancer his son is feeling better and uh, Bublé certainly feeling quite fine actually did a duet with Diana Krull and then it was on to the performances including Arcade Fire who opened the shore with the show with a rousing version of everything now take a listen
But tonight was also a good time to celebrate some of the new voices on the Canadian music scene, voices that took home some Juno Awards. Jesse Reyes winning for Breakthrough Artist of the Year, and Daniel Caesar, an R&B artist from Toronto who's been doing it his own way with his own sound, not signed to a major label, winning the R&B Juno. But Jesse and Daniel came together tonight and actually performed together. Daniel doing a surprise appearance on one of Jesse's songs. An amazing moment. A lot of people really captivated by Jesse and Daniel's talent. Another captivating moment was one that was unplanned. The reunion of the Northern Touch All-Stars who decided to take the stage over and did an a cappella version of their famous hit from 20 years ago. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Vancouver. Lots of highlights, so much talent. For example, Ruth B. Two years ago, she was just 19, working in an Edmonton clothing store, living at home with her parents. And then she started posting videos of herself singing. Then a year ago, she won the Juno for Breakthrough Artist of the Year. And since then, a whirlwind of concerts across North America, a new album, critical acclaim, all of it capped off this weekend. She had three nominations. And, and she said this time around, she's going to sit back and enjoy the Junos. Ruth B. is our national interview. We sat down at Vancouver's Vogue Theatre where she performed a few days ago and I asked her what it's been like for her over the past year. It's been amazing. Um, thinking back then, I don't even think my album was out yet, so at that time I was just really excited to get more of my story out there and have people hear what else I had other than Lost Boy. So it's been such a great journey and I've really enjoyed you know, getting out on the road and performing and just watching people experience my album for the first time. It's been fun. Is there either on stage or in a studio or I don't know where, a pinch me moment in the last year? Uh, many, I would say. Um, I think every night that I, I just finished up my tour and every night that I would go up and the kids were singing my songs with me, I'd, I'd never get used to it. I think it's so crazy because I wrote most of those in my room with the idea that no one would ever hear them. and so. To have people kind of sing them with me was always pretty surreal. Hey guys. She didn't just write them in her room, she launched her career from there. Let's be BFFs. A teenager posting six second videos on Vine. I am a lost boy from Neverland, usually hanging out with Peter Pan. Within a week, that snippet had thousands of likes and people wanting more. It turned into Lost Boy, an international hit. Play in the woods, always on the run from. Captain Hook. Music was always in my life and I loved it, but it was always my secret and Vine kind of helped me expose my love for music to the rest of the world and yeah, if it weren't for that, I don't know if I would be here. Yeah, I mean that's incredible that a, that a, a kid from Edmonton can make videos in her bedroom and then get how many people following? It was insane in the beginning, it was thousands every day. and. I think it's, uh, social media is so cool for that reason because I don't think there was really any other way of me getting my voice out there. Like you said, Edmonton, it's not the biggest music city. So I think it's great because you can have people hear you when you're just in your room. So it's awesome. Hey guys, it's Ruth B and I'm back at my old high school, Ross Shep, to visit the choir class who's singing my song, Lost Boy, for the Canadian Music Class Challenge. A lot of people have complicated relationships with their high school and dream about going back as a success. Not many people get to go back to their high school when they're as young as you with a hit record in your pocket. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> that was amazing. I loved that. Um, it's weird because a lot of the songs on the album were like ideas that were born in high school for me or memories that I had from high school. And so it was really cool to go back and kind of see the hallways that shaped who I was and then get to sing my song with the choir there. It was, it was awesome. tens of thousands of kids around the world who want to have a hit record. You've done that now. Sometimes getting the second hit is harder than the first one. Tell me about Probably. that <laughs> pursuit. Um, I think I would agree. I think the second song is probably harder, but I think I try not to think in terms of hits. I just kind of write and, and feel, and then if a song strikes something in me, I'll be like, I want to put this out. But I think if you start thinking in terms of, is this a hit, is this a hit, you're never going to be content. Because I'm not perfect, I'm flawed. And if you don't like that, get lost. Because 
Cause I don't want it if it's fake I don't want it if it's just for show For show I was on your Twitter account today, which I, uh, you know, I follow you. I occasionally am on your Twitter account, and I was, I was looking today. And then on, on the margin, it, it suggested, like, since I follow you, that I might want to follow Justin Bieber or Shawn Mendes. Right. And I thought, okay, the, what's the connection there? Young, talented Canadian musicians. Like, you're part of this incredible wave. I've, I'm not seen it in my lifetime. I mean, add Alessia Cara, they're, they're a hand. What's going on in Canada right now? I ask myself the same thing. I think. Like Canadian music is incredible right now, and there's there's so many, and I love how it's it's very diverse. Like we have hip hop and we have pop and R and B and singer songwriter and, and everything, and I think it's really cool. And I'm just excited and honored to be a little little part of that. And, and one of them is the Weekend, who yeah. shares uh, the kind of ethnic background with yeah. you from Ethiopia. Is that just a coincidence, or is there something about Ethiopia <laughs> and pop music success? I mean, I think Ethiopian music is is amazing, and it's really rich melodically if you listen to it. So. Maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> I feel it in my bones, you're moving on for good this time. I said that's what I wanted, but I think that was a lie. I read sometimes about hit songs and, and there seem to be these teams of writers and producers and sometimes it's hard to tell who the artist is in that yeah. kind of blender of music. You know, you're still writing your own stuff and it still sounds very distinctively you. Do you think you're going to be able to hang on to that? I think so. I think for me that's one of the most important things. I feel like this would be a lot harder and not as much fun if I was singing songs that I didn't mean and that I didn't connect to. So. I'm just trying to tell my truth and hoping that people connect with my stories in the same way. It makes the whole experience a lot more fun. And I know that you think you found better now, but that's only because you don't see how I dance with the idea of you dancing with somebody new. You seem, you are so poised. Does anything make you nervous now? Oh my god, I get really nervous, but I think um, it's just experience with performing. I've been doing it a lot now over the past couple years, so you definitely get used to it. But I just try to enjoy everything and have fun with it. And um, the nerves are there, but I've learned how to control them. I forget the exact wording, but you tweeted something out not long ago about how, you know, avoid complacency or complacency is death. And it's yeah. just like, so what's your goal? What, 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 what do you strive for? Oh, so many things, but I think in terms of my music, it's um, just to like always make sure that I'm saying things that I believe in and, and writing songs that matter. I never want to just put something out, just to put something out. I want to believe in everything and, you know, hopefully make someone's day a little brighter or make them feel less alone. Well, you are as down to earth as you are talented, so it's a real <laughs> pleasure to finally meet you. Thank, Thank you. You, you very too. Much. Thank yeah. you. Wow, she's so interesting. That conversation you had with her about writing solo, she seems really determined to keep, you know, doing things her way, precisely her way. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, there she is in her parents' basement uh, doing these six-second videos her way, but it gets increasingly challenge, challenging, right, Adrian? She, she debuted a new song at a concert on Thursday night, and I asked her if she had to clear that with her management and label, and she said, yeah, because a lot of people are invested in her career now, but, but she's committed to... Keep her voice, write her lyrics, write her music, and, and keep that distinctive sound. Excellent. We have a whole lot more ahead tonight, including the moment. But first, a moment of redemption for Winnipeg's Jennifer Jones as she won the Women's World Curling Championships. Starting to float. Starting to float. Coming back. No! And Canada is your world champion. The Canadian team beat Sweden in today's gold medal game in Northern Ontario, toppling the Olympic champion 7-6 to six in an extra end. She also won the world title 10 years ago. Jones failed to make the Winter Games in Pyeongchang. Here's a look at what we're watching this week. Monday, the deadline for Kinder Morgan to clear trees for its Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion before birds begin nesting. Dozens of protesters, including the Green Party leader Elizabeth May, have been arrested in the Vancouver suburb of Burnaby recently for violating a court injunction keeping the public away from Kinder Morgan-owned properties. 
And it may be cold, but Thursday, the boys of summer return with the home opener for the Toronto Blue Jays. They'll take on the New York Yankees, already considered frontrunners in the AL East. It has been a decade since the Bare Naked Ladies performed as a five-member band, and since frontman Stephen Page left in 2009, the five haven't even been in the same room together. But as Eli told us earlier, tonight they were reunited on stage at the Junos, and that is our moment of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, they deserve it in a big way. The newest members of the Canadian Music Hall of Fame, the Bare Naked Ladies! If I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, buy you furniture for your house, maybe an ice tester field or an ottoman. You welcome to the stage a whole bunch of people. I know some of them. If I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars, well, I'd buy you a fur coat. How can you not smile oh, and sing along while that is on, Adrian? I remember reading John Lennon once said, and he wrote such great songs. For him, the definition of a great song is one that people just sing along to. Well I, well, I know we were, firstly, but also I was sort of half expecting that when they got on stage, I'd be looking to see, you know, are there any weird moments happening? Are they looking at each other? But all I can think about is that is a party I would love to be a part of. It looks like a fantastic night. So Simon and Garfunkel reunited, BTO <laughs> reunited, uh, Bare Naked Ladies, ABBA next. That's a party we'll go to. That is the National for March 25th. Good night.